Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise to make my contribution to these debates for 2016. Well, Mr. Speaker, from the outset, I must make the observation that the budget itself, the speech by the Honorable Minister of Finance, the contributions from that side of the House, it is clear, it is patent that the members on that side of the House and indeed the entire government have lost touch with reality. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the entire government seems to be in what political commentator and comedian Bill Maher refers to as a bubble. Republicans like Sarah Palin are in this bubble. They are also in this bubble. I do not know how they will extricate themselves from it. But you Mr. Speaker, the sad reality is that the entire country is going down, down, down because of this administration and the policies they are trying to implement. Enough has been said. We know that the budget lacks vision. We know that instead of restoring confidence, it is doing the exact opposite. It is eroding confidence in every sector, in the common man, in the business people, in the private sector, the people that will develop this country, that will turn things around. Mr. Speaker, I listened to Honorable Member, Ms. Wade, a few moments ago. All I kept hearing about was systems in place. Systems in place, systems in place. But Mr. Speaker, what systems are in place? What specifics are in this budget to tackle any situation that is confronting this nation? And foremost is the crime situation, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, nothing is outlined in the budget. No concrete, carefully crafted plan that will extricate us from this crime situation that is out of control, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, our people are being slaughtered. Our people are being slaughtered by marauding bandits. And the Honorable Minister of Public Security and indeed the entire government have no answer. They have no answer for the crime situation. I will concede that we had a, the PVPC had a high crime rate, but now it is out of control. It is, and the statistics from the Guyana police force tell us this. Murders are up and out of control, armed robberies, rape, you name it, all the violent crimes are out of control. And Mr. Speaker, there are now calls, there are now calls in a nine-month government for the resignation of the Honorable Minister of Home, um, Public Security. They are now called to be echoed by the business community for the Honorable Minister's resignation. That is how serious this crime situation is. And Mr. Speaker, West Barbies and East Barbies, where I live, is bearing the brunt of it, Mr. Speaker. We are bearing the brunt of it. Just two days ago, a businesswoman of Chinese descent was murdered in her home at number 57 village. Prior to that, you have the young man, Mr. Speaker, Kishundia. He's a, 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 a member of the Hare Krishna movement. He came back from worshipping. He was just finished worshipping, Mr. Speaker, and he was gone down in his home. What was he trying to do? He was trying to prevent the bandits from gaining access to the home where his parents live. He was killed because of that. Mr. Speaker, he is a hero. He, is being cre he was cremated today. He is a hero. Market vendor last Friday from Kanji robbed in her home. Taxi driver from Kanji shot, is hospitalized. The list goes on and on and on. So, Mr. Speaker, for 
It to be said that the crime situation is under control is a gross, gross misrepresentation of the reality on the ground. That is why I said initially that the honorable members on that side of the house are out of touch with reality. They are in a bubble. Operation Dragnet is an abysmal failure. Abysmal failure. Mr. Speaker, but here, here is another shortcoming of the budget. There is nothing to replace it. There is nothing to replace it. There is no plan. There is nothing to replace it, Mr. Speaker. So where is the SWAT team? Why is Barbies without a permanent SWAT team that is fully manned, well equipped, and well trained to respond quickly to crimes? That is absent from Barbies. So they have no, there is no crime plan. And Mr. Speaker, the policemen and women of our country need to be given the tools, the equipment, and the training to do their jobs. That is not being done also. And it comes back to haunt us, Mr. Speaker. The, the Central Quarantine Chamber of Commerce has just issued a press release, Mr. Speaker, lamenting the prime situation. And this is what they're saying, Mr. Speaker. Instead of focusing on business development, this is the fourth press release by this Chamber of Commerce in the last six months dealing with crime as the major issue. Barbies business community is sick and tired of the crime situation in the region. Who is next? Can we develop a country like this? Where is the public security minister? The public is being decimated by bandits and are extremely insecure. Where are you, sir? End quote. In an environment like this, Mr. Speaker, the business community are focused on so, not just their own lives, conserving their own lives. They're focused on remaining alive instead of developing their businesses and investing. And that is what we need to turn this country around. But it cannot happen. The environment has not been created, Mr. Speaker. The environment that the government has to, the responsibility to provide, a safe and secure environment for investment, both local and foreign, unless that situation is, is addressed, among many other situations that have eroded the confidence in the, in the economy and in the government. They, we will not see any progress I do not know how we will achieve that 4.4% growth that the honorable member spoke of. That, that is a myth. That will not happen with the current situation as it is. Mr. Speaker, the honorable member spoke about rice. Well, Mr. Speaker, the rebirth, rebirth and growth of and the overwhelming success of the rice industry under the stewardship of the PPPC administration is well documented. It is well documented. The facts cannot be denied. 1992, just to give you one major fact, Mr. Speaker, we moved from 90 tons to 2014, 365 tons. It's a major contributor to the GDP, so it's a major foreign revenue earner. But Mr. Speaker, this phenomenal success, this great success story did not happen by magic. It did not happen by magic. It took prudent management. It took insightful leadership. It took visionary leadership to intervene when it was necessary. Mr. Speaker, the rice industry was not without its problems from 1992 to the present time. As a matter of fact, in 1994 to, to 1998, 2000, it, it experienced continuous growth. But then the industry was hit by low prices, as it is now. As it is now, Mr. Speaker. In addition to the low prices, the farmers 
and the millers had it all invested in new machinery, new equipment, recapitalized their entire operations. So they were heavily indebted to the bank. So there you had it, a crisis loom. A crisis loom. They could not make their loan payments, as is happening right now, Mr. Speaker. But what did the PPPC administration do? After being lobbied by the RPA, who highlighted the problem, the champion of the earth, Dr. Barrett Jack Dale, who was the leader, adapted the president at that time, intervened. He intervened, Mr. Speaker. The caring government that the PVPC is, they intervened with a menu of measures, a plan, a white paper, a 10-point plan was laid out to save the industry and to ensure that it did not crumble as it is right now. Among the measures implemented, Mr. Speaker, is that they, they were, first of all, they were tripartite talks. The government, the rice farmers and millers, and the lending institutions were in talks. So this, they were in discussions, the problems identified, and then the, the, the solutions offered. What happened? The accrued interest was waived on the loans. The interest that was capitalized was also waived. Loans were rescheduled, renegotiated to allow the farmers to make smaller loan payments and at a lower interest rate. The loan amounts in some cases were reduced. In exchange, the lending institutions were the taxes payable by the lending institution on those loans, on the interest, uh, the, the profits made, were waived. So the banks got to keep those taxes. Government waived the taxes. That is a measure that is quite easily, quite easy to implement, Mr. Speaker, in the present situation here. And the sum total is that you had a situation, a government intervention, where the brilliance of the scheme was that the government did not have to go into its coffers. It did not take the government to go into the coffers. It did not have to go to the treasury. It paid for itself. It paid for itself. So that is a brilliant strategy. That is a scheme that was implemented by the PPPC that saved the, the rice industry from disaster. I'm calling on the Honorable Minister of Finance to do the same. They have no AFC government if they really care about the, the, the lives of the rice farmers, the livelihood of our country, of our people. They will do the same. But Mr. Speaker, it did not stop there. In 2004, 2005, when you had the... the I remember you have three minutes more. Oh, Mr. Speaker, could I ask for the Honorable Member in addition to the three minutes, he has, still has due to him to have a, his last five minutes in addition to that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Honorable Member for her statement. Honorable Member, you have, you will be speaking for 20 minutes, a total of 20 minutes. Thank Please you, Mr. Proceed. Speaker. The interventions did not stop there, Mr. Speaker. In 2004, 2005, when we had the, the inclement weather, the, the floods, the government again intervened and gave the farmers 400 million in cash, direct intervention of 400 million in cash to ensure that they went back into the fields and they could have bought fertilizer and whatever else was necessary to ensure that the rice industry survived. This is the, these are the kinds of measures a caring government would implement. So, Mr. Speaker, I say all that to say this, that under the PPPC, the people of Guyana were already enjoying the good life. The good life came to an end on May 11, 2015. And there is nothing in this budget to ensure that the, any assistance to the rice farmers. Mr. Speaker, if the honorable members on the other side could point me to one measure in the budget that will assist the rice farmers directly, I will concede. But they cannot do that because it's not in this budget. 
It is not in the 2016 budget, Mr. Speaker. Now, Mr. Speaker, the Honorable Member spoke about Gaisuku also. Well, it is said that $9 billion will be pumped into the sugar industry. That is commendable. But we are not given any specifics. As it was last year, we do not know where the $12 billion went. We do not know what will be done with this $9 billion that will be invested in the industry. Would it be put to proper use? Would it be used to purchase, to, to do mechanization? Would it be used to change the field layout so we get higher yield? Would it be used to save the industry, Mr. Speaker? Now, Skellen was referred to as a white elephant. Skellen was referred to as a white elephant. I find, that, I find it very ironic. I find it very ironic because obviously the members on that side are ignorant, are completely ignorant of the facts, which I will give them now. 2015, the last crop in 2015, the Skellen Estate made its production target. Two weeks before the factory was scheduled to close, the estate actually achieved its production target. It produced cane, it produced sugar, sorry, at a TCTS of tons cane per ton sugar at 11.4. The problem that we will have moving forward with scaling, your Mr. Speaker, is that this administration has refused to engage the private cane farmers in the upper quarantine area. The scaling factory by itself, the cultivation does not have enough cane to supply the factory. That is one of the biggest problems, continuous grinding. The solution lies with the cane farmers who have lands adjoining the factory and closer to where the estate cultivations are. But the honorable member, Mr. Holder, was written to since June 5th, 2015. The cane farmers pleaded for a meeting. The cane farmers pleaded for a meeting with the honorable member. That has not materialized to date, Mr. Speaker. We are now in February 2016. By slowly but surely, the administration is going to ensure that all the cane farmers in the upper quarantine area are wiped out, are wiped out. They are going into bankruptcy as we speak, and the government has seen it fit to do nothing about it. They, they are all, their own commission of inquiry that was commissioned by this government at such high cost informed them that the private cane farmers, for example, at Wales, are producing. I'll remember you have three minutes remaining. Thank you, kindly, Mr. Speaker. Are producing uh, better quality canes, and they have a higher yield than the, the, the estates themselves. So therein lies a part of the solution to the Wales debacle. Not to close it, Mr. Speaker, but give it to the private cane farmers as a solution. Keep the people employed. Do not retrench 1,700 workers, Mr. Speaker. That simply cannot be right. Is this the good life that was promised? Is this the good life that the people were promised? It cannot be right, Mr. Speaker. It simply cannot be right. Mr. Speaker, this economy, as we know, is on life support. This budget has dealt a death blow to several businesses, including the used tire business, the, some auto dealers will go to business, those who are unable to obtain these licenses and tax compliance, will go out of business. Mr. Speaker, the budget, the promise of the good life is an illusion. It is an illusion. It will not be achieved. There are no measures in this budget to achieve it. What, it, what this budget is, 
Mr. Speaker. What the government and the minister, the, 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 it, it has robbed the people of the good life. The role of the government and the Honorable Minister of Finance is now likened to that of an undertaker. They're putting, and this 2016 budget is the final nail in the coffin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Beautiful. Beautiful.